In every life, there are moments that cannot be explained. Moments of mystery and luck, good or bad, when fate may make all the difference. We begin around 7 a.m. on the morning of October 3rd, 1995, as Dawn Little was driving her young sons to the school bus stop in St. Louis, Missouri. This day, the kids were running behind schedule, and so was I. Larry and Jarek were trying to convince me to drive them to school. And I said, look, you have to be at school at a certain time, and I have to be at work, so I need you to get on the bus, okay? And they said, oh, reluctantly, they said, okay, but they went. Twenty children rode Ernestine Blackman's bus to Bell Reeve Elementary School each day. Hi, Ernestine. Hi, boys. Don's older son, 10-year-old Larry, was sitting three rows behind Ernestine. It's funny. Larry was actually complaining about where the bus driver had assigned him to sit. The kids on the bus, they get a little wild because of all the fun that they're having. Hey, you better be quiet. She said, don't talk so loud, because I got a headache. Tom Middlebrun was driving the same highway on his way to work. All of a sudden, the school bus just seemed to come out of nowhere. I started hearing the screams coming from the bus of uh, these kids just screaming in terror. Somebody open up! We told her to say something, but she didn't say anything. Somebody hand me that microphone. I noticed the CB radio. Miss Ernestine Blackman taught us how to use the radio in case of an emergency, like a, an accident. Some little girl found the squelch in the volume for me. Hello, uh, there's been an accident with a school bus on... on Their base answered. Their first question was... Are any kids hurt? I told them I didn't think so, but their driver was in definite trouble. Okay, thanks. Okay. I said, who stopped this thing anyway? How did you guys stop? And they all start shouting, Larry did it! Larry did it! And I go, well, where's Larry? And this little head pops up, deadpan face, and he goes, I'm Larry. I thought to myself, if somebody's got to do something or our hope is lost and everybody's just going to die. Eight-year-old Jarek was relieved that his older brother had taken control. At first, I thought a lot of people were going to stop the bus, but nobody did. They never got up or nothing. They just sat there and cried and cried and cried. I was sad because she was real hurt and she had to go to the hospital and I thought she was in real pain and she was. At the local hospital, it was determined that 42-year-old Ernestine Blackman had suffered a stroke. Lauren Champagne couldn't be prouder of his 10-year-old grandson. Larry and I, from time to time, we work together on my old vehicle, because I've got two old trucks, and he's familiar enough that he knows that a brake is supposed to stop something. 
he believes that he has a tremendous amount of knowledge at his age. So he, he feels comfortable with taking action and doing those things. Three weeks before the incident with Larry, we had a tragedy. I lost my son, who is Larry's father. And then when this thing came, that was like an answer from God. We could sit and talk that maybe God called your father in. We lost him, one life. But through your father, you know, you possibly have saved many other lives. All the awards and everything that I got, I never occurred that all of this was going to happen. So I never thought of myself as a hero. Larry was even named honorary ball boy at the St. Louis Rams game. I think he's, he's going to be a fine leader. I think he already is. St. Louis is lucky. The kids are lucky. I don't even want to call him a kid. I have more respect for the way he behaved than I do for most men that I meet. Kids, we have a special surprise for you. All of you know this lady, Mrs. Blackman. A month has passed. Doctors expect Ernestine to make a complete recovery. I've always tried to teach bus safety on the bus because it's an important thing for them to know how to use the radio, how to stop the bus, how to evacuate the bus, and everything like that. We miss Ernestine for not being our bus driver because the other bus driver yells at us. I do miss having Miss Blackman as my bus driver. I do hope that she gets back to driving soon, but not too soon. I'm grateful to Larry for what he done for me because had it not been for him, I could have lost my life and the kids would have lost theirs too. This was truly a blessing for the lives of our children and the lives of the other children. I am very proud of Larry. I didn't think that my dad is falling down from heaven because I've never done anything great like this. <laughs> Next. I seen the car flying up into the driveway. I didn't really think nobody would get out. On July 6th, 1995, in Las Vegas, Nevada, a group of families were brought together by a tragedy that in a moment threatened to change their lives forever. The story is not a recreation. At 9.05 p.m., a call comes in to the Las Vegas Police Department reporting an accident involving a car. Emergency operator 63. Sonic, three people hit. Where? Order of Eastern Owens. Ambulance, now. Three kids on the ground. Okay, who hit him, sir? I don't know. A car, okay? Hit by a car. Is the car still there? Yes. Okay, hit. I'll get him on the way, okay? What's your name? Four kids down. Dwayne, Vice USA. They were just walking. They were just totally preoccupied, and bodies just flew every which direction. Four children had been on the sidewalk when a car jumped the curb and hit them. Dwayne Peake, who owns a bicycle shop nearby, had noticed one of them was on a bike. He was just riding along, and he was smiling and having fun. And then all of a sudden, boom, he wasn't. Tyrone Crum was one of the first to come to the boys' aid. I seen the car flying up into the driveway. I didn't really think nobody had got hurt. I walk out of here and I see bodies scattered everywhere and people hollering and screaming and my instinct took over. You know, I ran to the car and I lifted the car up and I said, somebody help me. We have to get the car off the little boy's head. His face is in blood. So I tilted his neck back just a little bit to bring his tongue away and I could hear him breathing. I was only about six to eight inches away from his face, making sure he was still breathing. I held him for almost 10 minutes. Okay, so we talk to me. What do we got? At University Medical Center, all four children are put under the care of emergency physician Bill Harrington. Bystanders who can do CPR or who can get involved really form that first link of the uh, chain of survival. Las Vegas Fire EMT Brett Denny is one of the rescue workers treating the victims. I have two children of my own, and uh, when I heard that there were kids involved, your heart starts beating faster, uh, you start getting butterflies in your stomach. 
being children, they go downhill fast. Brett brings in 15-year-old Babette Pereira. Her most significant injuries were the facial injuries. Later on, I did find out that uh, Babette was holding the baby. Two-year-old Amber Whalen is the youngest victim. She was prevented from having that direct impact of the bumper and probably saved her life. We were informed that the woman driver of this car had been cut off by another vehicle. She had taken evasive action and uh, went into four people at the scene. The mother of the other two injured children, Helen Ruano, arrives at the hospital. A thousand things go through your mind. How could it have happened? You have to go in the other way, man. Hey, come in this way. Is this from the same accident? Yes. Okay, good point. They're close, they're close. It's all right. It's all right. They're close, they're close. When you hear them hollering and crying, you know, it's scary. The most seriously injured child is this one right here. He's got a significant head injury along with some of the other contusions and lacerations, so he'll be the one we're most concerned with. Helen's seven-year-old son, Pedro, undergoes a CAT scan to determine the extent of his head injuries. He's got a little epidural bleed, but he has no shift. Uh, I'm Dr. Harrington. I'm one of the doctors taking care of the various children that are here. The seven-year-old, that's Pedro, I believe? Yes, uh, he's, he's the one that's the most seriously injured at this time. He's I thought my little boy was going to die that night. I really did. It was a very scary thing. We're lucky that nobody was killed here tonight. Yes. And uh, for that, we can be thankful. And uh, we're still hopeful that nobody will turn up to have any major permanent injuries. And uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed with Pedro in particular. <laughs> To help prevent further brain injury, neurosurgeon Lonnie Hammergren will implant a pressure monitor in the boy's brain. Just a small little blood clot, but it's the kind that can grow rapidly. Arterial bleeders can bleed real fast. That's the main reason to uh, get ahead of the game with this one. Just slow this one down, it's coming into here. A lot of that is temporalis muscle. Now I gotta get the angle right on this monitor. Here's a catching nice. And now we insert this to see if we got a wave for it. We got a wave, good. Surprisingly high pressure. Amber's mother, Diane Conroy is relieved to learn that her daughter's injuries are not life-threatening. They showed me where she was, and I just start crying because she's so little, she's so helpless. This is my first child, and I love that little girl. She's a sweetheart. It'll be two Sunday. It'll be two Sundays. What a nice birthday present, huh? If Babette hadn't been holding Amber, Amber won't be here anymore. I'm very grateful to Babette that she was holding Amber. Oh, oh, baby. Baby. Oh, no. Oh, she thinks it's her fault, but it's not her fault. During the night, the pressure in Petey's head had built up to 34 or 35. And they explained to me that anything over 20 could be dangerous. So they put a tube in so that they could release that pressure. This looks better. Look, Morris. The pressure's way down. Look at that. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Hi, Petey. Since they took out some of the the spinal fluid that's made in the middle of the brain, pressure has come down and we haven't even had to drain any fluid for the last couple hours. Wow, that's good. Maximal swelling is over the first three days, so we, we have to be yeah, real patient. Yeah, but today it looks, it looks huh. way, way better than yeah, last time. we just time. have to be real patient. We, we will. Hopefully tomorrow, I understand they're going to take Sorry. some of the sedation off, let them wake up a little bit, so 
That'll be an exciting day. I guess maybe I didn't emphasize to my kids that that busy street's a dangerous thing. And then the fact that my son didn't have a bike helmet. You know how long that could take? It never dawned on me until I saw him laying there in that bed. Keep our fingers crossed until tomorrow. $25 would have been cheap. See how he's doing. My fingers, our legs, our eyes, everything. Yeah. <laughs> I feel somewhat to blame for how he is now, for the fact that I didn't get it for him. Don't tell me you're still sleepy. You slept a long time already. <laughs> he's been moving a lot, though. Yeah. A lot. He's been moving. Over your eyes, Petey. Mm -hmm. I just pray that he comes back to us with all the spunk he always had. Hello. Hi, Come on. My Petey's a friendly person. He's a people person. Oh. And I pray that he comes back Mañana. with that still. Mañana. It's hard to think past tomorrow. You know, just pray that he's, he comes out OK. And if he doesn't, I'll just have to keep loving him the way I always did. Because he's such a special guy. Three months have passed. It's a beautiful thing to see Petey and Amber happy and smiling again, enjoying life. When she got home, she just sprung right back. She's feisty. She just wants to go out and get it all. She wants to do everything. I've been hoping with all my heart that I could give him a bike and see his little face light up. Mom, my first bike, and it's the same color. He's gone through a lot, but he don't let it bring him down. He's real active. He goes out and plays with his friends. It doesn't stop him from doing anything. <laughs> I learned that I should have a helmet on. When I ride my bike, I'm going to wear a helmet. When I stop and think about it, I cry because I'm so thankful. Yeah. I'm so thankful that he's OK now. None of us is promised tomorrow. And uh, I think it's a good thing that everybody can go on from here. <sighs> Touchdown. <laughs> Next, we shouldn't have been trying to ski so far. On October 26, 1991, Joey Biggs wanted to do something special for his 27th birthday. So he invited a group of close friends to go water skiing at a lake near their home in North Little Rock, Arkansas. But what should have been a celebration to remember turned into a day they would all prefer to forget. We had a birthday party that we was going to throw for him that night. Pooh Bear Winchester had been best friends with Joey for 14 years. He was like me in my shadow, you know. When you seen me, you seen Joey. Woo! Steve Roberts was the most experienced kneeboarder of the four friends. It's a lot of fun jumping the wake and just trying different tricks and stuff. get in what they call a slingshot, jump outside the wake, and you automatically double the speed of what the boat is doing. If the boat's doing 25, you're doing 50. It can be very dangerous. It was getting late, and we were about ready to go. But Joey said, well, you know, we'll ride in. We'll make the last lap. I've been kneeboarding a lot longer than Joey. He was just getting to the point of being able to jump the wake and slingshot. I noticed, man, we're going pretty fast into this corner. When you hit the second tree, it's like a baseball bat hitting the ball. Correct. I mean, it's just like it just tore him limb to limb. 
I was hollering and he wasn't responding. You're not supposed to move him, but I had to get his face out of the water. His eyes was in the back of his head and he wasn't breathing. It was a scary thought thinking one of your close friends was going to die. Kevin Wood immediately called for help on his cellular phone. There was a lot of things running through my head, whether it was my fault or not, being the driver. Come on, Joey! You could tell he was broke all over. Instant swelling in the arms and legs. They doubled in size within two minutes. Come on, Joey! And I pressed on his jaws, and he just shot water out of his nose and mouth. And went to gargling on me, just... Come on, breathe, Joey. He didn't realize how bad he was busted up. He just knew he had a birthday party to go to, and he was wanting to go to it. But when he seen his arms, he just went hysterical. 5,000 skyline. We shouldn't have been trying to ski so close to the bank. We knew better. We knew the lake was dangerous, but we didn't ever think nothing would happen, especially not just like that quick and that serious. Come on. Within five minutes, a Metropolitan EMS unit arrived, including paramedic Jeff Pace. I've never seen anybody that had that many bones broken. I was worried about having a head injury. I was worried about him having a fractured neck or a back. And I thought his time was real close to being up. Be okay. I know him like a brother. He knows me like a brother. You sit there and see one of your best friends scream bloody murder. It's... It's hard on you, you know. We got the and he didn't have a drop of blood on him. I got you, but I was worried about all his internal bleeding. We wanted to get him into the hospital as quick as we could, because there was not a whole lot we could really do for him. 27-year-old right. Joey Biggs was taken to University of Arkansas Medical Center, where he was examined by trauma surgeon Lon Bitzer. 27-year-old male involved in a voting accident. When I first saw Joey, I thought that he was going to die. But we were having trouble keeping his blood pressure up. You want to hang blood now? We were pouring blood into him as fast as it was leaking out, and we had not been able to stop his bleeding. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Connie, please call and give us some more blood. He's undoubtedly one of the worst cases I've had since I've been down here. Joey was rushed into surgery. After operating on his abdomen and not finding any source of bleeding there, I told his family there was a very good chance that he wouldn't survive this despite all our efforts. Joey's family and friends, including his sister Sarah Mathis, waited to hear any hopeful news. As the night went on, it kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. That's when I knew that he may not make it. And it scared me because I love my brother. The first night we was there, he used 30 units of blood, not counting platelets and plasma. He liked to die on us three times. After returning Joey to surgery one more time, they were finally able to slow the bleeding. They come out and told us that they've done everything they could do, and it's up to Joey. It's going to be up to him if he's going to pull himself through this. Hey, buddy. The best part was when he opened his eyes and I knew he could hear me, and he knew we were there. That's getting straighter. After Joey. four months in the hospital, Joey was transferred to Baptist Rehabilitation Institute. Physical therapist Jeff Dobbins took over his care. Let it relax. It was just amazing how many injuries that he'd had. In fact, it took 10 months to get his legs to where he could bend and straighten them effectively. For a long time, I didn't want to live. But my sister and all my close friends gave me a lot of love. All of them really really pulled me through this. I see got a little wind, okay. That's it, that's a 300 yarder. Right. He's doing great, he's working out, going places, he's back to normal. Being a pest. <laughs> that's it, Joey wins $5,000. Sir had to give me shots every day and push me when I didn't want to do anything and call me bad names and all of it. She's more than my sister. She's everything to me. She's everything to me. Okay, 122. 
When you're that age, in your 20s, I think you think you're invincible and nothing's gonna happen to you. That's it. Joy's grown up a lot. I think it's made him more mature, and it's brought me and Joy closer together. And I tell him I love him every day. My accident brought us together like brothers. If they didn't do their part, I may not be here today. The first time I seen him get out of his wheelchair, I want to cry. But I can smile, too, you know, because I seen where he come from, and I seen what he went through. Now I'm proud of him. I'm really proud of him. I feel good about myself now. I have my days when it, I can tell you when it's going to rain. I'm a pretty good weatherman now, but I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Next, when I first saw the baby, it just didn't look real at all. To take this little child in my hands, I've never held a dead baby. On the morning of April 15, 1995, Mark Crenshaw, his wife Michelle, and their youngest child, two-year-old Kobe, were running errands in Loves Park, Illinois, when a moment's decision tragically changed their lives. made my man. Colby, it was his nap time. It was like 12, 31 o'clock, so he was cranky. He was a pretty bullheaded little boy. He, he was wanting to get out. I'll pop up here and I'll let you out, all right? I was getting frustrated with him. He was driving me nuts. So I undid his car seat so he could move about in his car seat a little bit more comfortably. Ten minutes, fifteen minutes, we were sitting there, and, and I had thought I'd seen my wife come out of the store. Oh. Is that mom? Well, I started driving, and the parking lot was pretty full, so I had to go around a bunch of cars to the far lane. Stopped. Help me! Somebody help me! Somebody he looked at me, me, and his little blue eyes just rolled in the back of his head. Where you at? Dart Schoonmaker was the store manager on duty. Voice came over the radio, kind of a frantic voice of one of our stockmen, and it sounded like he said a child got hit by a car in the parking lot. So I immediately started running out the front door. I didn't know what was going to happen next. A registered nurse, Lynn Massey, happened to be driving by. No one was actually doing anything with him physically. So I looked at him, and he looked awful blue to me. Everyone back up, please. His eyes were closed, his blood coming out of his ear. And I didn't see any signs of life. No CPR, back up, please. Back up. I was very scared. No pulse. Let's start CPR. Okay. On five. I touch a Walmart shoppers. If there's a doctor in the store, would you please come to the service center? Rick Baker, a former EMT, heard the page. I'm I thought if I could help, I would. And I could tell when I looked at this young man that he was very scared. You could tell that there was something very desperately wrong. Got anything? No pulse. When I first saw the baby, it just didn't look real at all to take this little child in my hands and not feel any life whatsoever. It's a feeling I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I heard Michelle Crenshaw being paged in the store, and I know I had a weird feeling. I remember going, please tell me Michelle Crenshaw works here. I'm Michelle Crenshaw. Oh, Michelle, there's been an accident. You dropped the parking lot. And I came to Mark, and he grabbed me, and I know, I remember, it was like immediately, you know, is he dead? Two and three and four and five. Back up, we continued CPR, but still no response. There really wasn't any change. Check his pupils, one, two, three, anything? four, and five. I was in shock. I know it wasn't good. I 
told my wife it wasn't too good. And then finally the paramedics showed up. By the time a Rockford fire ambulance arrived on the scene, including paramedic Chris Scott, it had been almost 10 minutes. The patient's still unconscious, no pulse. And when I actually looked down and saw the two-year-old boy laying there, that's when your heart stops and you, get, you move faster. Okay, you got the head pulled over? All right. I never lost traction on the baby's head and spine. There's no way I was going to stop. I was going to do everything I could for this little baby. Everything was being done that could be done at that particular time. But it didn't look good, and I wasn't... I mean, it just hits you that, you know, here's another two-year-old that possibly isn't going to make it. As they pulled away, I, I thought I'd probably be going to his funeral. You know, I cried a lot afterwards. I just, I've never held a dead baby before. We were about a minute into driving to the hospital, and we put him on the heart monitor. And lo and behold, I mean, there was a heart rate there. At Rockford Memorial Hospital, two-year-old Kobe Crenshaw was examined by emergency physician Spiroanalytus and Dr. Jane Kotecki. The call came in as a trauma arrest. In all practical purposes, he's as good as dead. Okay, guys, the count three. One, two, three. He had a heart rhythm at the time. He was not making any respiratory effort on his own. He did have a pulse, however, it was very slow. Give him the atrophy. Let's go, let's go, guys. This is part of his brain. Scan, he's got air in the brain. The impact that he took to his head was hard enough to cause him to have a broken skull. That's what made him run away to be comatose. When they took us to a waiting area, we sat there for hours. We just sat in that room and cried. We had no idea what was going on. Mrs. Crenshaw? Hi. Hi, I'm Dr. Kotecki. How's In addition going? to the skull fracture, right. Kobe had suffered collapsed lungs, broken ribs, and ruptured spleen and kidneys. It was very hard for all of us to go out there and say to the mom or to the dad, and all of a sudden, boom, you're about to lose a child. I told her that it would pretty much be a waiting game over the next 24 to 72 hours to see if he would wake up if he would wake up at all. He was semi-comatose when he got to the hospital. They said that we might want to consider the organ donating. That scared me to death. I think that was the scariest part. We got up to the PICU, and you can only have two people at a time. But they just said you could have as many people as you want in there because they didn't really expect him to make it. After 72 hours, Kobe was still alive but he had no mobility in his arms and legs, and he remained comatose. They wanted me to talk to Kobe and hold his hand, let him know that I was there. So yeah, I just stayed there with him constantly. I knew Kobe would be fine, that they were just all crazy. This was crazy. There was just no way that God would do this to me. It was a couple months for the first time he actually moved his right arm just a little like over he's definitely a fighter he definitely fought this all the way on july 20th 1995 three months after he entered the hospital kobe was finally well enough to go home although he is still undergoing therapy doctors expect him to make a complete recovery it's been five and a half months since the incident i thank god for dart and rick and the nurses, if they weren't there at the scene that day, Kobe would not be with us today. How are you doing? Oh, great to make it. It's great. They gave him breath. The doctors really feel that that was really crucial to him. And you know, I can't thank them enough. How are you? This boy's got a lot of heart. Everybody in the world could have put her breath in that little baby's lungs. 
But I don't think if it wasn't for Kobe, what he had inside and the love that he has in his family is the only way that he got through it. It's the only way. But I'm just glad that I had a part in this little boy's life. I was surprised that he made such a rapid recovery as he did, and it does make me feel good. I think he was very lucky. Can I have some? To me, Kobe would be totally okay when he can jump up out of that crib and go. My normal Kobe is running around. That's a big thing. I mean, he's normal per se. He's still got the same personality and the honoriness, but he's not my normal Kobe yet. I would say just. Let your kids have their tantrum in their car seat. You just have to put up with it, I guess. Just don't undo their car seat. That's where I made my mistake. Don't drive with the car seat unbuckled. And just be careful. <laughs> Next, I observed what I thought was a child in the snow. And it was just as if he was trying to draw attention. I do believe that was his last effort. Oh, my God. Sometimes a single act of compassion can change the course of a life, as a pair of strangers in Detroit, Michigan found out on the freezing afternoon of January 18, 1994. The temperature was extremely cold. I think the wind chill was somewhere like 40 below. It wasn't the kind of weather that you'd be walking in. Sandra Harvey was on her way to pick up her nine-year-old son, Darren, and drive him the three miles home from school. I was at the supermarket, and I was late. When I got there, I didn't see my son. And that's when I started to worry. Ma, hello, Ma, have you seen William? I couldn't see him nowhere. So I had called my grandmother and I asked her, did he show up there? And she said no. She told me to go to the police. And as I was going to the police station, I said a little prayer. 71-year-old Rush Yarnell happened to be driving home on Connor Street. I observed what I thought was a child in the snow. And it was just as if he was trying to draw attention. Oh, my God. I do believe that was his last effort. And I made an abrupt U-turn. Naturally, there was people there that weren't too happy with me, but let's say I hadn't stopped. I couldn't live myself if something happened to that child. But when I first approached him there, he was face down in the snow, lifeless. It was, it was, it was a pitiful sight. God, it's a I tried to talk to him, nothing. Can you hear me? He had no gloves on. One shoe was off. His school books were strewn in the snow. And I never touched anything so cold all my life. I thought I was picking up a corpse. That, that got to me a little bit. Oh. On duty at the 9th Precinct that afternoon was Detroit police officer Sylvester Mitchell. Imagine, if you will, a piece of meat that you would leave in the freezer overnight. That's the way his fingers were. I mean, they were just totally frozen, purple to black in color. In fact, it was sort of an eerie feeling to actually hold his hand. That in itself sort of melted my heart. Minutes later, Sandra came into the same police station to report that her son was missing. William! What happened? Who are you, ma'am? When I came to the precinct and seen him up on the counter, and when me and him got eye-to-eye -eye contact, then that's when I broke down in tears. The EM man was telling me that he was close to death. 
Oh, you're welcome. Of course, I hugged her. And tried to convey to her that it was just a normal thing that a person should do. Yeah. It was quite an emotional scene. Is there anything I can do to help? Don't be afraid but to yell. She couldn't seem to. Stop thinking it's okay. Okay, Mom, you can over here. Yeah. When we actually got to St. John Hospital, they immediately started putting his feet and his hands in some lukewarm water, and his hands blew up like balloons, both of them. Plastic surgeon Joanne Levadam was brought in. Darren developed very large blistering on his hands. They required debridement, but it improved remarkably. And he has gone on to regain complete function in his hands. I got pretty scared because I thought that they was going to cut my fingers off. I was crying. I didn't want to lose these fingers because um, when I grow up, I would like to be a basketball player because <laughs> my mother said that I should be a basketball player because I look like one. <laughs> Take it easy. How's he doing? Uh, he's doing pretty good. I will always appreciate Mr. Yarnell. You know, I have a special place in my heart for him. That's the only son I have, and I just thank God my son is alive. And I thank God Mr. Yarnell stopped and did pick him up. In the years since the incident, Rush and Darren have grown close. Had he not stopped, the little boy would have froze to death. The weather was bad. The neighborhood was unfamiliar to him, and he didn't have to stop, but he did. This is the actual part of the, the President of the United States assassination. It's touched me very much so. There's no question about it. There's a reason that this little boy is going to go on, and uh, I want to stay close to that child the rest of his life as long as I live anyhow. So we say this is a North American B-25. He's a joyful man, and sometimes I pray at night time, and I say that he's my hero. And I beg him to save my life. If it weren't for him, I won't be here by now. You have a big smile. <laughs> That's the way to do it.